Thank you all for coming out to, to be a part of this. This is, um, it's so encouraging to see people, see you stepping forward with a deep interest for deep thought during Lent. And um, it's fun this year to have a real wide variety of people stepping up here to, to share. So um, lots of folks that are a lot smarter than I, but uh, it's a joy to be uh, sharing with you about uh, the field that I spent my uh, time studying uh, in, which is the, the field of the church fathers. So this is the title of my lecture tonight, The Order of Loves. And depending, as Junior said, on how you pronounce that, you are either in for a spicy novella about a love tryst on the coast of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> or a rather boring lecture on a church father. So cho choose your own adventure. Who's, who's in for, uh, for, for St. Saint Augustine and who's in for St. Augustine? That's, that, that's the trick. Um, well, we're, <clears throat> we're studying the love in lots of different aspects. And last week we had from Mateen the idea of the ethic of love, that the love is the, is the chief ethic of the Christian life. It's uh, the, the primary way that Christians make moral decisions and discern between right and wrong, love of God and love of neighbor. And today we're talking about something a little bit different. So um, I did my uh, PhD in patristics, and this, which is the study of the church fathers. And St. Augustine of Hippo is, is one of the chiefs if not the chief church father. The joke among patristic scholars is that uh, getting a degree, a PhD in patristics is like becoming a medical doctor. Uh, studying about Augustine is like becoming a cardiologist. I didn't say that patristic scholars were funny. <laughs> <laughs> but Augustine is sort of a specialty. <clears throat> He's, he's, his thinking is so broad, is so di and you can study Augustine your whole life and you're not finished. So um, John Calvin was a huge fan of this particular figure in the Institutes. Uh, he said, it is unnecessary to spend much time in investigating the sentiments of ancient writers. Augustine alone may suffice, as he has collected all their opinions with great care and fidelity. Any reader who is desirous to know the sense of antiquity may obtain it from him. So, at least we're with John Calvin tonight looking at this person. So, Augustine of Hippo. Who was Augustine of Hippo? Augustine was born in 354 to a Christian mother named Monica and a pagan father named Patricus, who was a, a Roman citizen in North Africa outside of Carthage. And he was resistant as a child to his mother's faith. He ran a little wild as a young man, womanizing and partying and, and uh, living it up in, ancient, in the ancient Roman Empire. But his mind from a very early age was crying out for, in a search for logic and meaning in the universe. His father pushed him into a field in the ancient world that was called rhetoric. Now, the field of rhetoric in the ancient world was very much like the law profession is in our day. You would hire someone trained in this field to win your arguments on your behalf. And so this was a very prominent field, and Augustine was very uh, good at it. He took to it, and, uh, and he, his, his career uh, advanced very quickly. But reading Cicero's Hortensius changed his life. Cicero was one of the people that you would read to train in rhetoric. And Cicero said that you need philosophy to live a happy life. Why? He said, everybody wants to be happy, and hardly anybody is. Why? Well, Cicero said it's because you don't consider the long-term effects of your choices and how they're going to impact the people around you and the rest of your life. And so uh, what you need for that, Cicero said, is an understanding of the universe and the way, the order of things. And that's philosophy. And so Augustine took that to heart. He said, I think I need a little bit more in my life than just running after pleasures. He looked to Cicero's philosophy, which was Stoicism, but that didn't fit. Uh, Epicureanism was very popular, but it seemed empty. 
So for a while, Augustine settled on an Eastern spirituality called Manichaeism. And I'm not going to go into all of these, um, but it comes up a little bit later in the lecture once again. Uh, but he, he devoted himself to this religion as hard as he could. It was a religion of dualism, of choosing between good and evil. But after a while of trying to make that work, he settled on a school of philosophy called neo Platonism. Uh, the, the point is that all of these things informed him. Whenever we come to Christ and we develop our Christian mind, all the experiences that God has given us up to that point, they, they start to feed in and they shape the way you address and understand the gospel. Augustine was successful at rhetoric. His career uh, went straight through the sky. He was fast-tracked and he soon moved to Rome and then to Milan in 383. And out of curiosity, he stepped into a church in Milan. There was a preacher in Milan named Ambrose who was drawing great crowds. And so Augustine stepped into this uh, church for the purpose of hearing a great communicator. I want to study the rhetoric of someone who can draw a crowd like Ambrose. But the Lord grabbed him. The Lord started to break into his, his life a little bit. He'd gone through a few crises, and he was going through some continuing crises in his life. Uh, one of them was he kept losing his voice. And when your whole field is rhetoric, <laughs> that'll get your attention. <laughs> and he may have had asthma, or, uh, or it may have been due to anxiety. Also, he had kept a concubine since he was 17, and he had a son with her. But as he was moving forward in Roman society, it was time for a, um, a marriage of social advancement. And so his, his dear Christian mother actually assigned a 12-year-old wife for him uh, for social advancement in the Roman society. And so he had to abandon the, the woman that he loved and the son that he loved and send her back to Africa. Uh, actually, he sent the wife to Af the concubine to Africa. He married the 12-year-old girl, and then um, he kept his son hidden nearby in an apartment. But all this was really ripping him up. I mean, his heart was just torn apart by all of this. One day, he and his uh, successful buddies bumped into a Christian that they knew, and the guy seemed genuinely happy and at peace. And Augustine asked his friends, who were all successful... They were all killing it. I mean, imagine a, a group of 20-something uh, New York City stockbrokers or something along those lines. And they're all, theoretically, they're at the top of their game. They're doing great. And he said, why aren't we happy like that guy? He doesn't even have a decent job. <laughs> I'm putting it in kind of our common parlance. But, you know, he doesn't even have a decent job like we've got. He doesn't have the prospects that we've got. But look at him. The guy is so doggone happy. And I'm miserable. Why is that? Why do we have all these unsatisfied ambitions? He was sitting in a garden the next day wrestling with this in his mind when some children nearby were playing a game. And part of that game was they would call out to each other, tolo lege, which means take up and read, take up and read. It's just a child's game. But the Lord put that phrase in his mind and settled it in his heart, and he couldn't get it out of his head. And so he, he went back into his uh, apartment that they were renting, his VRBO. <laughs> and uh, things don't change that much. But, so he's renting this place that's full of other people's stuff. And, and here's a, a book on the table. It's a book of New Testament letters. And he's got this take up and read, take up and read. Well, he picks it up and he thumbs to Romans 13, 13 and 14. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This, this cut through his heart. He had been gratifying the desires of his flesh in every way that he could figure out how. And here was this alternative. He opened his heart to Christ, and this was the beginning of a full conversion. 
He was catechized by Ambrose, trained in the faith, and he was baptized on Easter morning, April 387 A.D. His father died when he was a young man. His mother died three years after he came to Christ, and his son died at the age of 17. He returned to North Africa for a life of quiet study and philosophical contemplation. But he walked into the church and did some teaching, and the church literally grabbed him and forced him into the priesthood. They literally carried him into the church and ordained him on the spot as a priest. So watch out. <laughs> if somebody asks you to do something at church, you know, the best wisdom I can give is don't do it well or you'll be doing it for the rest of your life. Right, Susan? Yeah. <laughs> No, please do your best. Uh, but um, <clears throat> he, he, was, he was pulled into the church and they said, you're our priest. They ordained him as the priest of the church. But he knew that he had a checkered past. So he, he served quietly as a priest for a while, but then in 395, the very same thing happened and the church said, you must be our bishop. You must be the bishop of our region. And they, once again, they, they pulled him into the church against his will, pu pushed him up to the front of the church and ordained him as a bishop. Well, he knew that his past was about to emerge. He had a long checkered past, many lovers, many different places, many mistakes, many uh, broken, you know, uh, stories all down the road, littering the road behind him. So, he set out to write a book, an autobiography. He said, before you find out who I am, I'll tell you who I am. And so he wrote a book called The Confessions. Now, uh, this book was the very first autobiography that was not a self-congratulatory celebration. If you read things like Caesar's Gallic Wars or you read bio biographies of the day and autobiographies of the day, they were always uh, like shining their star. This is, uh, I'm gonna tell you how much I conquered, how much I won. I, Vinny Vidi Vicky, I came, I saw, I, I conquered. You know, I'm the greatest that there ever was. That's the only reason you would write something like this. This was the very first introspective, honest, uh, self deprecating, self-exploring, uh, self-evaluating um, uh, novel, book, autobiography. It absolutely changed the course of literature in Western civilization. Absolutely. So I can't understate how important this moment was when he decided to disclose who he was from his heart. And it's really not a very long read and if you, if you want to read something from a time period that is not your own, uh, from somebody from a long way away, you will be surprised again and again and again at how his story intersects with yours. As a bishop, he wrote a lot of sermons, commentaries, theological works. He's famous for confessions. He wrote a, a, a book called On the Trinity, uh, talking about the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He wrote The City of God over the course of 15 years. Uh, laying out the difference between the city of, of mankind, the city of man, and the, the kingdom of God, and how the values are different. And, and, uh, and this was a, a pivotal work, and he wrote a, other books like On Christian Doctrine and The Handbook of Christian Education, that sort of thing. Uh, he lived during the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and he knew it. Vandals were gathered outside his own city gates when Augustine was dying at age 76, he had psalms of repentance written large enough for him to read from bed, posted on all the walls of his chambers. He died with these psalms on his lips on August 28th, 430. All right, that's Augustine. Not St. Augustine, that's a different place. But St. Saint, Saint Augustine, that's St. Augustine. Augustine of Hippo. Okay, love moves you. What did Augustine teach and how does it help us today? Well, Augustine believed that love, love above all other forces has the power to move you, to change you, to transform your mind, heart, and will. Love changes you. What you love 
matters. You will become what you love the most. In fact, he is, he's sometimes called the theologian of love. There's no greater force in his thinking. So let's go back to his conversion story. Augustine struggled with unhappiness. Why am I, why am I so unhappy? He couldn't figure out uh, why he was so, so troubled and so successful at the same time. He said, I got what I wanted. Isn't that enough? He tried to arrange his life around this philosophy called Manichaeism that, that I know we don't have in our day, but uh, when you study these ancient religions, you see that they still exist. You know, they just come in different names and packagings. But this was a religion of dualism, that there's fundamentally good and evil in the world, and they're, in, they're equal forces. They're yin and yang, and, and you don't know which side is, is going to come out uh, above at the end of the day. And so as a, as a human soul, you've got both of these forces uh, interacting in your own life. Uh, and, and you need to choose what's good and not choose what's bad. And that is the way to the happy life. Good and evil are equally powerful. Pick the good. Well, what he found was again and again, as he tried to figure out what was good and make the choice for it, he found himself failing at that. He couldn't, he couldn't pick the good. Even if he knew the good, he couldn't pick the good. If he picked the good, he couldn't do the good. He couldn't follow through on the good. He said, what's going on? There's something wrong inside my, my, my heart, my head, uh, my, my life. Uh, he, he, he thought back and remembered a time when he was a kid, and his friends wanted to jump a wall and, and steal some pears. And, uh, and he said, you know... Uh, I jumped over that wall with them and I ran in there and, and I stole some, some pears with these boys and I, and I don't know why. Because I had, I didn't even like pears. <laughs> I had money to buy fruit. I wasn't hungry. I didn't need them, you know. Why did I do that? He said, I think I did it just because it's fun to do what's wrong. It's fun to be bad. <laughs> And, and so he thought, well, there's something in me that, that, that wants to pick uh, the bad over the good. So living in a system where it's just your responsibility to pick the right and, and leave the wrong, well, that isn't going to work because from my youth I can see that I have a tendency to, to choose what is wrong. He, he started to think more about this system of thought called Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism taught that the soul is elevated by the contemplation and enjoyment of what is beautiful, of what is beautiful. That beauty had a power to elevate the soul. So Augustine tried to live into that, but he also had memories of how beauty had trapped him, how his pursuit of beauty had, had gotten him stuck in some very awkward and painful situations, particularly when he had chased after the beauty of women. He felt ad addicted to some things, and he felt trapped by his enjoyment of beauty. And he felt that, that his body had a tendency to produce limiting habits. Habits. So you've got a cheat sheet on your desk there of um, a, a lot of hot quotes from Augustine that we're going to go through. So here's the first one. I cared for nothing but to love and to be loved, but my love went beyond the affection of one mind for another, beyond the arc of the bright beam of friendship, bodily desire like a morass and adolescent sex welling up within me exuded mists which clouded over and obscured my heart so that I could not distinguish the clear light of true love from the murk of lust." Love and lust together seethed within me. In my tender youth, they swept me in the whirlpool of sin. More and more, I angered you, God. The entire book is a journal to God. It's a letter to God. I angered you unawares, for I had been, and look at this, deafened by the clank of my chains. The fetters of the death which was my due 
to punish the pride of my soul. He couldn't hear God calling him back to freedom he, because his habits, his habits were like chains that, were, that not only were holding him down, but they were clanking around so loudly that he couldn't hear the call of God. He couldn't choose the good or the beautiful. His habits held on to him, and they kept him tossed and spilled, floundering in the broiling sea of my fornication, he said. Messed up, troubled. So that's the theme of, of Augustine's life, is that, that unsettledness. He said that we're unsettled until we settle uh, with God, until we come home to God. So here's how his confessions opens. These are the opening lines of this book, Confessions. Can any praise be worthy of the Lord's majesty? How magnificent is his strength? How inscrutable his wisdom? Man is one of your creatures, Lord, and his instinct is to praise you. All that's created has within it a desire to glorify the creator. He bears about him the mark of death, the sign of his own sin, to remind him that you thwart the proud. But still, since he is part of your creation, he wishes to praise you. The thought of you stirs him so deeply that he cannot be content unless he praises you because you made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. So fast forward to the conversion scene. It's in book eight of Confessions. He said at that time, you never depart from us, yet it is hard for us to return to you. Come, O Lord, and stir our hearts. Call us back to yourself. Call us back to yourself. Kindle your fire in us and carry us away. Let us scent your fragrance and taste your sweetness. Let us love you and hasten to your side. This is him beginning to feel a change, beginning to feel a longing that God would call him home. But he doesn't quite want to get there yet. My thoughts as I meditated upon you were like the efforts of a man who tries to wake but cannot and sinks back into the depths of slumber. For the rule of sin is the force of habit. Keep that in mind by which the mind is swept along and held fast even against its will, yet deservedly because it fell into the habit of its own accord. So he's, he's, you see how stuck he feels? His habits are like chains. His habits are, he's got these, this, this expectation. The body takes on these expectations of, I've, I've done these things, now my body wants to do them again. I've, 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 create, I've habituated myself to this pattern of life and now it just sort of runs on its own. It's got its own momentum. It's, a, it's rolling on downhill. He's stuck. His Christian friend was telling him to just pray. Hey, just pray and open up to Jesus. But he kept delaying, even though he knew, and here's our next one, but if I wish, I can become the friend of God at this very moment. As a youth, I had been woefully at fault, particularly in early adolescence. I had prayed to you for chastity and said, have you heard this quote before? Give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> for I was afraid that you would answer my prayer at once <laughs> and cure me too soon of the disease of lust, which I wanted satisfied, not quelled. That's honest, isn't it? He knew the truth, but he couldn't force himself to step into the truth. He couldn't force himself to accept the truth. He wanted to will it. Just like the mind wills to move a part of the body, just like my mind, why can't I just will myself to accept the truth and open my heart to God? Just like I will my hand to reach out and grab a, a, a pencil or a book or whatever else. The, the, the mind tells the hand what to do and it does it. Why can't I tell my heart the same? Why can't I tell my mind the same? He says there's a disease. Something is diseased in my heart, in my mind, and they don't obey even my will. It is a disease of the mind which does not wholly rise to the heights where it is lifted by the truth because it is weighed down by habit, habit. So there are two wills in us. Because neither by itself is the whole will, and each possesses what the other lacks. There's a conflict, conflict. 
The same is true when the higher part of our nature aspires after eternal bliss while our lower self is held back by the love of temporal pleasure. It's the same soul that wills both, but it wills neither of them with the full force of the will. So it is wrenched in two and suffers great trials because while truth teaches it to prefer one course, habit prevents it from relinquishing the other. This was the nature of my sickness. I was in torment, reproaching myself more bitterly. I guess we're turning the page, huh? <laughs> Good. I thought I got it all on one page. I guess I didn't. Um, where was I? Oh, tormented. Okay. I was in torment, reproaching myself more bitterly than ever as I twisted and turned in my, what's that word? Yeah, see, I get to do that with you guys. You know my preaching style. My chain, habits and chains. I hoped that my chain might be broken once and for all because it was only a small thing that held me now. All the same, it held me. And you, O oh Lord, never ceased to watch over my secret heart. God's always more after us than we're after him. You know, and he knew that God was, was after him all his life. God was pursuing him with grace. Stuck, wrenched into Augustine, broke down in tears in the garden. And he heard, that's when he heard the kids saying, take up and read, take up and read. So he opened the Bible and read the passage about freedom from lust. And his heart opened like a, a floodgate. I had no wish to read more and no need to do so, for in an instant as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. Then we went in and I told my mother, remember, her, remember his mother, not a perfect woman, but she was a faithful Christian. She prayed for him all her life, Monica. I went and told my mother who was overjoyed and when we went on to describe how well uh, sorry, how it had all happened. She was jubilant with triumph and glorified you who are powerful enough and more than powerful enough to carry out your purpose beyond all our hopes and dreams. For she saw that you had granted her far more than she used to ask in her tearful prayers and plaintive lamentations. You converted me to yourself. The habits of the body are strong. Sin is like a, a chain, deafening and binding. But the heart longs for God and will respond when the love of God breaks in. Love is a power to move you. So, order of loves. Uh, what do you think of this proposition, this thesis? You have never done something you did not want to do. Is that true? Maybe. You've never done something you did not want to do. You see, in some sense, even when you've done hard things, or you've done things that were unsavory, you've done things that were difficult, you were choosing them over other things. You went to work because you wanted to get paid. You might not have wanted to go to work that day, but you wanted to get paid more than you wanted to not go to work. <laughs> so in some sense, you, you never do anything that you don't want to do. With sin, you wanted to do it. But Augustine sees so much more complexity in this, doesn't he? Your habits pull you. Your mind isn't clear or sharp enough to see what is good, and your, your will doesn't have the strength to choose what is good. And that, has become, that is because for him at the root of it, your heart is not directed to love what is good. So let me say it one more time. Your mind isn't clear and sharp enough to, to see what is good. Your will doesn't have the strength to choose what is good. Why? Because your heart is not directed to love what is good. Love moves you. You know, this is, you know, say, um, uh, 
well, I, won't, I probably won't be able to remember this, but there's a, I think it's Chuck Colson who would say it's the constable or the, well, never mind. It, you, you <laughs> see, it's one thing to obey from the exterior, to say these are the rules I dutifully obey, okay? But if in your heart you hate those rules, if in your heart you hate the one who's, who's directing you, um, then all that time, that's just, that's just dutiful obedience. And that's never really going to get you free. Your heart has to change. Your heart has to change to love what's good, to want what's good. Not just to do what's good, but to want the good. So where is your heart directed, is his question. Love moves you. You grow toward what you love. You become what you love. Remember when Jesus um, sat with Peter after Peter had denied him three times, and, uh, and the risen Jesus sits down with Peter. They have breakfast together. What does Jesus ask Peter? Do you love me? He doesn't say, why did you betray me? He doesn't say, you know, what were you afraid of? Um, he doesn't say, didn't you know I would come through in the end? He asks about love. Why? Because each time that Peter betrayed Jesus, he was choosing to love his own safety and his own well-being more than to love the Lord. And he wanted Peter to have a moment to re-examine that. What are your true loves? Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Yes, Lord, you know that I, I love you. The root of sin is loving something more than Jesus. For Augustine, we get stuck when we love something more than we should. We need ordered loves. One, two, three, four. Ordered loves. Of course, the more, most important thing is that God is at the top, but the chain of proper order of loves can get a kink in it at any point when we love a lower rung more than it deserves. This is what we call an inordinate love. You have an inordinate desire, an inordinate love. So Augustine discriminates in his teaching between what, is, what he says something to be used, which means something that is not ultimate, not the end, but was meant to propel us toward the ultimate end, and things that are to be enjoyed. So here's your next quote. Some things are to be enjoyed, others to be used. And there are others which are to be enjoyed and used. Those things which are to be enjoyed make us blessed. Those things which are to be used help and, as it were, sustain us as we move toward blessedness in order that we may gain and cling to those things which make us blessed. If we who enjoy and use things being placed in the midst of things of both kinds, wish to enjoy those things which should be used, our course will be impeded and sometimes deflected so that we are retarded in obtaining those things which are to be enjoyed or even prevented altogether, shackled by an inferior love. To enjoy something is to cling to it with love for its own sake. To use something, however, is to employ it in obtaining that which you love, provided that it is worthy of love. Thus, in this mortal life, wandering from God, if we wish to return to our native country where we can be blessed, we should use this world and not enjoy it so that the invisible things of God, being understood by the things that are made, may be seen. That is, so that by means of corporal and temporal things, we may comprehend the eternal and spiritual the things which are to be enjoyed are, now here's the list, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, That's, it's hard to follow. And, and he isn't saying don't enjoy anything of this world. He's, he's using these categories to explain that everything that God has made is here to lead us home to God. But when we get sort of uh, attached to, to the beauty of the things that are made, well, then we get stuck. We get short-circuited. We love the gift instead of seeing the gift 
as an opportunity to love the giver, you see? We love the creation over the creator. And so now we're stuck. Because, you know, what is that? It's idolatry. I've set my heart on something that, that isn't God. So there's God and there's what God has made. Everything that God has made is meant to guide us upward to God. But if we stop and, and as he says, enjoy, if we get attached to those things as though they are the ultimate thing, then we stop our journey. We are meant to move up beauty to the beautiful, to move up goodness to the good, to move up the gifts of God to the giver himself. James 1, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So the first step to a proper order of loves is to make sure Jesus is at the top. The image that, uh, that I like to use is of a, a mobile, like when, uh, when kids make uh, these hanging um, collections of, of pictures or images or items, shells or something, and they're all hanging on little bars of wire and on, on ropes hanging down. And, uh, you know, uh, my daughter Ellie came home from school with one of these in her backpack and, and uh, it had been sitting in the bottom of the backpack and so she pulled out this wad of, you know, yarn and wire and, and different little pictures and she said, look, Dad. I said, wow, that is beautiful, Ellie. You know, as every good dad, you know, would. <laughs> at this big mess. <laughs> and she said, no, no, no. And she, she picked the right piece of it. And it started to unsort itself and, and fall down into place. And I saw what she had made. That's what it's like to have Christ at the top of your order of loves everything else starts to fall into its proper place and you see the beauty of it. And, and you don't actually lose the value or the beauty of these subsidiary things. You actually see them in their proper place and it allows you to appreciate and love them aright and then to, to appreciate through them your love for the higher things, the things that matter more and appreciate eventually your love for God who's at the very top of the order of things. So this is Augustine's conviction of, a, of rightly ordered loves. Um, as long as you grab Jesus and pull him to the top, other stuff will start to fall into place. But it is still our responsibility to order the rest of our lives too. So virtue is defined by Augustine as having rightly ordered loves. So next quote, he lives in justice and sanctity who is an unprejudiced assessor of the intrinsic value of things. He is a man who has an ordinate love. He neither, this is fun, we'll hang on for this one. <clears throat> he neither loves what should not be loved, nor fails to love what should be loved. He neither loves more what should be loved less, loves equally what should be loved less or more, nor loves less or more what should be loved equally. Got it? Yeah. No sinner should be loved and that he's a sinner and every man should be loved for the sake of God and God should be loved for his own sake. The point, disordered loves produce disordered lives. When we take something that is good but less than God and we make it ultimate, uh, we're trapped. We're trapped in idolatry, breaking the first and second commandments. But for Augustine... It also chains us to a lower way of life. We get stuck in chains. So here's another bit. For bodily beauty is indeed created by God, but it is temporal and carnal and therefore a lower good. And if it is loved more than God is, who is the eternal, inward, and everlasting good, that love is as wrong as the miser's when he forsakes justice out of his love for gold. The fault here, though, lies not with the gold, but with the man. And this is true of every created thing. Though it is good, it can be loved well or ill. When the proper order is observed, uh, well when the proper order is observed, and ill when that order is disturbed. 
This is how I put it in some brief verses in praise of the candle. These are thy gifts, they are good, for thou who art good hast created them. Nothing in them is from us apart from sin, which arises when we neglect right order and love that which thou hast made instead of thee. We get in a pickle when we love anything in place of God. In place of God. But we also get messed up when we love lesser things over more important things. Love God, love neighbor as you love yourself, everything else below. Wisdom is figuring out that order. So, hope for disordered love. Say, okay, that's great, Augustine. Glad you figured that out. What about me? The answer is not to dull your loves, but to sharpen them. To, uh, to try to, uh, to, to, to encourage them. It's not that you, you love too much, it's that you're, you're loving the wrong thing. So you, you want to sharpen your loves. And above all, let the love of God rise to the top and govern all other loves. Confessions 10, he loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee, which he loves not for thy sake. What does that mean? He says, it's not that you're loving too much, you're loving too little if you love anything else beside and equal with God. So for Augustine, the good news is that God has intervened to reset our loves. He has come down in Jesus Christ to reveal to us his own character and glory. And when we see the greatness and glory of God, we see how lovely, how worthy God is. And our love rises, our love for God rises to the, the top, giving the lie to all of our lesser disordered loves and passing attachments. Give me, uh, sorry, Confessions 13, give yourself to me, my God. Restore yourself to me. I show you my love, but if it is too little, give me strength to love you more. All that I know is this, that unless you are with me, and not only beside me, but in my very self, for me there is nothing but evil. And whatever riches I have, unless they are my God, they are only poverty. He says, God, you've got to get inside of me. You've got to make me love you more. You've got to help me. Help me love you more. Help inflame my love for you higher and higher and higher. So the Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts, Romans 5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. With God's love in our hearts, the other things that we love, the other loves can be measured against that. Discipleship, wisdom, is weighing out and sorting our loves. Uh, one last point, the Holy Spirit does some sorting for us. So here's something that he wrote again in Confessions. A body inclines by its own weight toward the place that is fitting for it. Weight does not always tend toward the lowest place, but the one which suits it best. For though a stone falls, flame rises. Each thing acts according to its weight, finding its right level. If oil is poured into water, it rises to the surface. But if water is poured onto oil, it sinks below the oil. This happens because each acts according to its weight, finding its right level. Ancient, you know, science class. Um, but look at the bold there. When things are displaced, they are always on the move. Until they come to rest, where they are meant to be. In my case, love is the weight by which I act. To whatever place I go, I am drawn to it by love. By your gift, the Holy Spirit, we are set aflame and born aloft, and the fire carries us upwards. Our hearts are set on an upward journey, Psalm 84, as we sing the song of ascents. It is your fire, your good fire, that sets us aflame and carries us upward, for our journey leads us upward to the peace of the heavenly Jerusalem, it was a welcome sound when I heard them saying, we will go to the house of the Lord. There, if our will is good, you will find room for us so that we shall wish for nothing else 
but to remain in your house forever. Uh, the Holy Spirit can inflame and, and, and order these loves, point things out, sanctify us in that way. So one of today's great Christian philosophers in the Augustinian school is James K.A. Smith, and uh, you are what you love, and On the Road with St. Augustine are books that you've heard me quote in sermons, and Smith does the, the work of piecing these doctrines together, some of what we've talked about and more, uh, along with Augustine's theology of the body. What is the body doing? The body, the body takes habits. The body is, is very plastic. You've heard of neuroplasticity. and God made our body to, to, to take on habits. And, and we sort of get into these, these ruts, these wheel ruts. Uh, the body, you do, you do a thing a few times, your body expects it. You have a cup of, uh, of coffee every morning at, at 7.30, your body is looking for that, right? Uh, you, have, you have a Snickers bar at 3 p.m., you know? Your body is going looking for that. And, uh, and so that's true in, in a whole host of ways. Our body creates habits. And these habits, when they're, they're headed in the wrong direction, can be chains. They can be chains that bind us and, 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 and hold us down. But why did God give us this gift? Because we can also produce good habits. We can also train our body in good habits. And um, chief among them uh, would be, uh, it won't surprise you to hear me say this, going to church on Sunday. <laughs> or worship, worship, the habit of worship having regular rhythms of worship. Why? When we worship, we see the beauty and glory of God and are reminded that God is a more worthy love than all the other things we love. That's number one. When we worship, I, th I think we had a slide for that one. Do we have, Ben? For the when we worship stuff? This is like my big landing because you guys have all got to go to church after listening to this. Uh, when we worship, number two, we feel the inflaming fire of the Holy Spirit burning and sorting and turning us into cinders that rise up out of the ashes. And when we worship, we develop a habit of holding God in first place above all other things loves. Worship orders our loves. Disordered loves, disordered lives. Ordered loves, ordered lives. Peace and rest in him. That's Augustine. So I'm going to have you turn to one another and, uh, and ask two questions around uh, your table. Um, just for about 15 minutes. Here are the two questions, and they're not written down anywhere, but they're not very hard to, um, to hold on to. Number one, is it easy or hard to order your loves? Number two, how far down the list does it start to get difficult? So just share with one another, you know, you can share your deepest, darkest. But I think the top few are usually pretty easy. But then it gets a little bit more challenging. So the first one is, is it easy or hard to order your loves? And the second one is, at what point going down the list, let's say you get down to eight, nine, ten, where does it start to get a little bit more difficult? To say, I'm not sure what's more important, this or that. Okay. Have at it for a little while, and then I'll take questions up here after that. It was just great to hear the hum and the buzz of the conversation around these tables. Y'all do generally pretty good work when you're talking amongst one another, learning from one another, and so this is great. Um, do you have a question? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, just waving, okay. Um, so now it's time for uh, some Q&A, and I've already uh, have our first question teed up. Well, Tim, thank you for uh, walking us through such a complex 
um, journey, a fascinating one, uh, but I yearn for even more simplicity. Mm. And uh, my question is, <laughs> and this is, this, I'm not trying to be silly, this is a serious question. Uh, if there is such a thing as an elevator speech for this, yeah. would, it, would it possibly be love the Lord your God yeah. with all your heart, strength, and mind, or, or not? That would work very well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, um, and that's, you know, that's the, uh, what he's, he's chiefly getting at is that we'll, we'll tend to love lesser things and we'll hold on to them and we won't put God in that first place. And once you've done that, um, you really get in a stuck spot and it's gonna take the great intervention of God's grace to get you free again because the chains that wrap around you and your habits as you pursue trying to be satisfied with something that doesn't truly satisfy, um, you'll get addicted. You, you're in, idolatry is addiction. Um, the thing that you have set up uh, to worship instead of God, in place of God, um, you're expecting it to deliver something it can't deliver. Uh, but it continues to promise and uh, John Orberg constantly refers to an article in a psychological journal that said that the title of the article was, it's hard to get enough of what almost satisfies. It's hard to get enough of what almost satisfies. And that's idolatry and that's addiction um, because the promise is there and you always feel like, I think I'm just short of, of, of reaching the satisfaction point. Uh, but you're you're trying to slake your thirst with gulps of salt water, and so you just get thirstier and thirstier and sicker and sicker, uh, but always with the promise that maybe next time I'll be satisfied or maybe a little further I'll be satisfied. So how do you free yourself of that? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's gonna get you started. Well, how do I do that? Well, you can't just buckle down and do it because you're really sick and you're really stuck, and you're really habituated to try other things, the Lord needs to intervene with this grace. You have converted me to yourself. You remember how he said, uh, I knew that you were, even then, you were shepherding my heart. You were watching over my heart, even then. And uh, the, so uh, from Augustine comes the beginning of, of the strong uh, understanding of grace that God is always moving towards us with ferocity before we, uh, before we even know uh, the, the, the depth of his love for us. Okay, court has something for you here. As promised, she thought you would have a question. <laughs> well, it's not really a question as much as it is a suggestion. You talked about <clears throat> prioritizing or making a list in what order. Yeah. If you want help making that list, there's a book that Junior told me about several years ago, which I've read a couple of times now, called False Gods. Okay. The yeah. author is Elizabeth Scalia. Great. And she talks about the things and writes about the things in our lives that we put in front of God. And anything great. that's before God is a false god. That's great. That's the next step, really, is, is I've already talked about idolatry. I mean, this, when you talk about order of loves, what you're really talking about is there's something lodged in there that's way, too, that's way too up towards the top. And even down the chain, you know, Augustine would say, yeah, even down the chain, you can get a little kink in there. Well, that's a, little, that's a problem, but it's nothing like when you've got idolatry capturing your life. And um, so books like... Strange Gods. Strange Gods. Elizabeth um, Scalia. Or uh, you could take a book like uh, uh, Timothy, uh, Tim Keller's uh, Counterfeit Gods and, and start to ask yourself these questions. What's the, what's the thing that I'm relying on? If it was removed, um, 
I would squeal. If I, if I lost it, I would be threatened to lose my will to live. It's the last thing that I think about when I go to bed at night. It's the first thing I check on when I come to consciousness in the morning. When I'm lingering and not thinking of anything else, my mind drifts towards it. That thing is capturing your heart. Is it Jesus? <laughs> it's probably, you know, you're thinking of things that are not Jesus. They're competing. They're competing with that place. And in the order of loves, as we're studying love and trying to understand what is this force and how does it operate in our lives, uh, ordered loves bring an ordered life that brings peace. And at the very top of that is, ooh, whatever's capturing the top spot of my love and attention and devotion that has got to be Jesus. That has got to be God. Anything else is gonna keep me wrapped up in clattering and binding chains. Okay, we now have a teacher to teacher question. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, as you know, C.S. Lewis learned a lot from Augustine. Yeah. And on this subject, he said something like this. When we put first things first, we get second things thrown in. Yes. When we put second things first, we get neither first things nor second things. And I find it's great. Uh, in, my, in my life uh, that if I, if I try to order uh, loves correctly, the problem for me isn't that I might get mixed up between the eighth love and the ninth love. The problem for me is uh, is the division between the first love and any of those other loves. Uh. Because it seems to me they're, they're, in my life, they're always vying to kick God out of first yeah. spot. Yes. And so, uh, yeah. do, do, you, do you think Lewis is right? It makes it kind of easy. If we focus on, on always... Uh, seeking to develop a deeper, more abiding love for Jesus, that the other loves will find their rightful place? Or do you think it's a battle, a battle to get them all, the all in the right place? I, so I, anecdotally, I would say I'm with you, Mateen. I'm spending the, most of my attention and most of my energy on the very, very top. Like, what is really up there? I don't really get down into the eights and nines and tens um, very often, if at all. You know, the real battle is what's at the top. And um, yeah, Lewis is interesting because, yeah, he said, um, if I love God aright, then I will love my, uh, my friends aright. I will love my spouse aright, my neighbor aright. I'll actually love them better for having loved Jesus first. I'll actually love them better for having loved Jesus first. We had a question uh, last uh, week about, look, aren't I supposed to love God above all else, how can I have any love remaining for anything else? And um, my answer to that question is um, that there are things that diminish by use and there are things that multiply uh, by use. And um, you, you have a drink of water, you drink half of it, it's half gone. But you've used the water and it's been diminished by use. But love, when you use it, it isn't diminished. It's expanded. And so why is that? Well, it's because it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's connected to the undiminished giver. It's connected to God, the creator himself. So when you love, you actually multiply love. You don't spend it out. You multiply it because you're, you're, it's rooted uh, just like the other fruit of the Spirit, the other nine fruit of the Spirit. It's rooted in God's character himself as the creator. Uh, he's the undiminished giver. When he gives, he's nothing less. He's still the same God as he gives. So, that, so um, when I love God aright, I'm gonna love everyone else better. I'm gonna love my, everything else in, in its proper place. And because it's in its proper place and I'm loving it in its proper place, uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna appreciate it um, more, more fruitfully. And it's, it's both going to allow me to, to love that thing well or better, and it's also going to allow me to love that thing with 
an appreciation of it that drives my heart to give thanks for the giver of that thing, the maker of that thing, the creator of that thing. And, and so I'm gonna be in this relationship where by loving God aright, I'm loving this other thing even better. Now, he also had a passage in The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis did, where he, um, he really gives Augustine a poke in the eye about this. And uh, he says, um, Augustine seems to think you can escape the dangers of love by putting everything in its proper order. And that's where he goes on to say, uh, but the truth is, you, you can't, uh, I've quoted this in a sermon recently, you, you can't, uh, there's no safe option. Um, if you want to keep yourself from getting harmed by love, you can't just put it all in the right order like old Augustine thinks. Uh, you, you have to trap your heart and encase your heart in the hobbies and interests and distractions and lock it up as in a box or a coffin. And inside that, that box, it, your heart won't be broken, but it will be changed. It will become unbreakable. It will become hardened, irredeemable, unlovable. And so he says, uh, the only way you know, to accept love is to accept uh, the risk of harm. But in other places, he really loved the idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and said, like you said, well, if I love Jesus all right, then I'm gonna love everything else better too. It's, you know, when you're in a marriage, you know, it, is, is Jesus at that, at that top place? And you think, look, I don't want you to love, I don't want my wife to say she loves Jesus more than me. <laughs> but you do want that. <laughs> you do want that, you know? And you want to love the Lord more than you love your spouse because now you can love each other aright and you won't try to capture each other. You won't try to, to, to get your full satisfaction out of each other. He, Augustine takes a lot of hits on using this language of used and enjoy, because now you're making it sound like I use my wife to enjoy God. Um, well, don't take that too far. What he's saying is that just understand there's, there's a difference. Put Jesus in his first and proper place, and now you can love your wife in the right way. And you won't be trying to, uh, to get everything that you need out of that relationship, which will capture her and bind you. No, you'll be able to love her with an appreciation for the God who made her. And you'll know that your full satisfaction, your full enjoyment, your full contentment, your total happiness, your eternal bliss is in God. Yeah. Careful, I'm a preacher. One yeah? question for back here. Um, yes. Back to the Shema. Yeah. Love your neighbor <clears throat> as you love yourself. But yep. what if you don't love yourself mm. much? Right. Uh, real quick, Shema is, is um, isn't the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Is that Shema? Um, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so that great command, that great commandment, love the Lord, love the Lord your God and uh, love your neighbor as yourself. What if you don't uh, love yourself? Um, people take a couple of different schools of thought on that, um, but I am in that school of thought that says that that command is a command to love yourself in the right order or to love yourself aright, to appreciate yourself. Uh, not more than your neighbor, but to, uh, to have uh, an appreciation for how God made you and is reflected within you. And again, you can get self-love improperly ordered. You can have an inordinate self-love. That's actually quite common <laughs> in our times. Uh, you can have an inordinate self-love where, where yourself, you know, I am my own God and I am my own pursuit of my own satisfaction. I'm the captain of my fate and, and, uh, and uh, that inordinate self-love. But to have yourself in a, in a proper order of loves, to love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm of the school of thought that says Jesus is trying to tell us that that's an important component. And so if you're, if you're struggling with um, self-love, uh, that's something to, to spend some, just as you, just as you would uh, try to love um, anything in God's creation aright, you can apply energy to loving yourself aright. 
and appreciating um, the, what God has made uh, of, of who you are. The judge. Uh, so this uh, discussion has been naturally enough uh, about our individual yeah. view of things uh, right. that you're talking about. So is there kind of a corporate par parallel here Great. that we could apply this these kind of things to? I mean, I know at the end you talk about worship, but to me even worship uh, can be too much of an individual thing right. as opposed to a corporate thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you've got in, in this man and in, in the course of his life and, and this product, the confessions, is the birth of Western individualism. And that, that's not too much to say, you know. So on the negative side of running around with, the, with Uncle Augie is he's a little bit me in the middle sometimes. Um, but um, uh, so he, he's very focused. This is a this is a self exploration, and and the whole Western world took off in that direction until we got to the point of rugged individualism and of um, uh, what's the big phrase from Carl Truman that I use all the time? Expressive, um, expressive individual. individualism. Thank yes, you. the voice from yeah. above. Expressive expressive individualism. Well. Where your um, your your primary task is to foist your inner self out onto the universe and demand that the universe accept it. Um, it's kind of it's kind of coming to the unnatural end. I think I mean I think he's he was healthy, <laughs> healthy self focus, but still this was the birth of of uh, of, of Western individualism, uh, and um, uh, so others. Um, in the Augustine story, uh, a huge part of how God reached him was through others. Uh, he wandered in, well, his, he speaks a lot about his mother. And Monica is considered, um, some of you would have a Roman Catholic background and could tell me, because I think she is a saint of a certain, is she a saint of motherhood or of, anyway, she's a, she's a model. See, I still, when I'm studying patristics, I still use the saints and stuff. That's because we're all saints. We're all believers. <laughs> it's, a, it's a priesthood of all believers. We're all saints. Um, and, uh, but uh, Monica, uh, she prayed for him all of his life with deep devotion and tears at her bedside. And, and she celebrated with him when he came to Christ and, which was late in life. And, and she was uh, with him to celebrate his baptism. And so there's another focus there. When he came into the, the, uh, the cathedral in Milan where Ambrose was preaching, uh, that was, you know, what happened was um, he left, he wanted to hear an expert communicator and watch how he measured his rhetoric and appealed to the masses and moved hearts and minds. But he got captured by the music by the singing, and he found himself days later with these songs penetrating his mind. Ambrose had taken um, a huge radical and controversial s step. He had brought the water organ that was used in Greek theater into the church. <gasps> and, and, and people thought, a lot of people gave him a huge hard time about that because you're bringing this horrible instrument of Greek theater into the holy places of God. But Ambrose was writing music. He was putting uh, music to the Psalms, and this organ was playing, and there was a choir singing. And Augustine just, he, he couldn't get these songs out of his head. And, uh, and that was what chased him down the road as much as the messages of Ambrose. And so I guess what I'm saying is I'm, um, uh, n nobody's an island, nobody's always an individual. Um, and we, in, in his story, there's all these places where it took the whole body to be coming at him and, and helping him. Uh, deep friendships um, that, that were just briefly mentioned. These are deep friendships that he explores deeply in his, in his writings um, that were walking along 
with him and saying, don't you think you could open your heart to Jesus? And, and, uh, and, or wrestling with him on that other side. I don't know why we're not happy like this other guy is. And, and um, so, so others uh, were, were used by God in his life in a big way. And if we're going to rightly order our loves, uh, that's where I landed on, you know, when you come into corporate worship, you're coming into a body of people whose intent it is to put Jesus at the top. That's going to help you. You know, rather than sit at home with your pen and journal and, and you know, measuring things out and doing the pros and cons list and, and, you know, trying to fight it all out, fight the demons off on your own, you know, come into the, the body of Christ and you've got this whole body of people, this, these eternal souls who are gathered in the power of the Holy Spirit are resolved all together to put Jesus at the very top, and you're gonna get wrapped up in that, and that's going to pull your loves, stretch your loves, measure your loves. You're gonna forget about that darn thing that you has occupied all of your, your mind all week long that probably is becoming an idol. For at least a minute, you're gonna be free of it, and you're gonna see the glory of God. And, and then you, you'll step back into life and start the battle again. Does that help? One question here from Jim. He, he also had a lot of doctrine of the church and stuff and sacraments, and, but a lot of community in his life. Yes, Jim. Sort of a rabbit trail. How is this relating to your dissertation on Basil, and how is this also run in with a timeline of the canon of the scriptures? Yeah, great. So, How does that weave together? Uh, Thank you. You might be the only one who's interested in the answer, but <laughs> <laughs> Basil's just a, a generation prior to Augustine. So Basil died three, I think it was 379, and um, Augustine really was just coming up in, in his own at that time. Um, Basil was a Greek writer. He and his, his brother and his friend both named Gregory, were, are known as the Cappadocians. And, and they did a lot of writing in the Greek about um, the doctrine of Jesus Christ and, and, and about uh, the doctrine of the Trinity in between the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the Council of Constantinople in 381. So that all happened in the Greek world. There was the Greek world and the Latin world. Augustine really grew up in the Latin world but he was able to, to take a lot of translated Latin uh, Greek materials. And Ambrose was actually a translator of some Greek materials. And so Augustine became a compiler of uh, kind of all of these debates. Um, so how would they uh, relate to one another? Um, <laughs> there's a, uh, there's um, a, uh, an opening to the commentary of the Psalms that is attributed to Augustine uh, where he talks about how uh, the Psalms are the perfect music of the Holy Spirit, that he wrote them in order to change our hearts and to order our loves and uh, to make us um, appreciate the beauty of God above all other beauties. And um, I guess I would just say, when you get into the world of patristics, um, I think that Basil actually wrote that. And there's a bunch of stuff that winds up getting misattributed. When somebody gets really famous, every quote is theirs. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for reading that, my dissertation. You're one of four people that did. Could you close us in prayer? <laughs> I can. Thank yep. you all for being a part of this and you know, just thinking about love and... Um, <laughs> You know, when you do Ash Wednesday on Valentine's Day, the only way to make up for it is to spend eight weeks seriously talking about love. And uh, so that's, that's what we're doing, and thank you. Next week, uh, you're gonna hear from Dr. Junior McGarrahan on more on worship and how worship uh, changes and shapes our loves, the habitus of worship, the habits of coming into the presence of the Lord and glorifying his name together. So uh, come back. For that, and we've got uh, great stuff to come uh, even after that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Uh, how many ways, Jesus, have we found ourselves 
bound and deafened by the clanging of our own chains of sin and of ferociously ravenous addictions and habits. Oh, Lord, send your Holy Spirit, shed your love abroad in our hearts. Set us free by love. Break the chains. Pull us towards you. In our weakness, Lord, help us to love you more. And when we're free, and when you're at the very top of our lives, help us to love all other things in order to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Love you. Thank you for coming out.